The tea situation keeps getting worse. Now, originally, I wasn't going to make this video, right? But I think now as the second bug has come out, the one we'll talk about in this video, it's almost required that I make a video about this. This, in my opinion, this incident where people's PII, personally identifiable information, is getting leaked on the internet is going to become more and more common, unfortunately, as applications are vibe coded, right? And now, first of all, I want to make it very clear. I don't think the T app was vibe coded just based on the timelines of the app's release, the timeline of the chat GPT 3.5 release, and just kind of the nature of how this all lines up. I don't think it was a vibe coded application, but as vibe coded apps like this become more common and people forfeit fundamental security knowledge, bugs like this are going to be extremely common. The bugs in question are twofold. The first is kind of like the V1 of the T-Hack, right? The T-Hack. This is from about two weeks ago at this point, where basically the way that the T-App works is to get verified on this application, what you have to do is submit proof that A, you are a female, and B, proof of identity that allows you to submit these reports on this app, obviously, right? They don't want people to be able to just to sign up without ID verification and then dox these men that are potentially not bad guys. You want real people to be making real reports. That's a great thing. The problem is is uh, the, the designers of this application use this tool called Firebase. If you don't know what Firebase is, basically it's like picture S3 buckets, which are an application from Amazon where you can store files. Um, they use Firebase buckets to store these files, right? The files, meaning the identification of these women when they're verifying their ID, the Firebase buckets were not secured, which means that anybody could go in and download anything from the Firebase buckets. Not only that, the women were told that their IDs would be deleted from those Firebase buckets after um, after they verified their ID, but it was recently discovered that applications at or before February 2024 were still inside those buckets. Not only that, they contained this crazy stuff called EXIF data. If you don't know what EXIF data is, EXIF data is data that your camera or your phone or whatever may attach to an image to give it more context, right? This means that the image may have information about what kind of camera it was taken with, the focal length of that image, the, you know, the step, the, the exposure, stuff like that. It also may have the GPS data of that picture being taken. This is an example image from Google or from uh, GitHub that I found where you can go download and explore the EXIF data in exifdata.com and bada bing bada boom, you can see exactly where this picture was taken. So unfortunately, the identification, so literally selfies and photo ID of 13,000 women was exposed in this Firebase bucket. Now, it is extremely important to highlight, now granted, I'm not a Firebase developer, right? I use AWS for stuff, but it is, from what I've heard, extremely difficult to set up Firebase to the point where you don't have authentication. When you make applications that use these bucket systems like S3 or Firebase, you know, Amazon, Google, you are required to write these access control lists or typically in like this JSON format. And you use that to denote what access controls, what uh, accounts are able to read and write to the database. And here we have an example of one of those ACLs for Firebase that says, hey, basically anybody can read and write to the database as long as their auth is not null, which means that basically if someone is logged in with proper Firebase credentials to this bucket, they can read and write the entire bucket. But what you will see here is that these security rules are not secure and it will warn them that any authenticated user can take these actions. And apparently, again, I'm not a Firebase developer, but people get emails about this stuff. People literally get emails over and over and over that says, hey, by the way, your bucket still exists in an unsecure state. Are you sure you know what you're doing? And in the case of T, they obviously didn't. Now, this is the first vulnerability that got highlighted very, very heavily on the internet. I'm not gonna go too much deeper into this, right? I think it's just important to note that like, not a great place to be. And you would think this is the, this is the end of it, right? Now, T actually put out a statement about this to kind of try to rectify it, right, with some corpo speak in there that basically said, hey, not great, right? This was a legacy authentication system, a legacy bucket. And oh, by the way, the archive data was only there for people that were uh, going up until and before February 2024. So anyone after that, there are no leaks, we're good to go. Until the most recent bug came out. 
<sighs> Mr. President, a plane has hit the second T application. A second T breach reveals user DMs about abortions and cheating. This is where I think the layers, the, the, the Shrek my swamp of this application start to kind of really show that there was no security, either forethought or like literally no security knowledge of how systems should be architected in this application, right? So the first application leak was basically, hey, the Firebase storage had an improper, improperly secured ACL, meaning anyone logged in could go query the database and get these images down. Oh, and also the images had EXIF data. Okay, this one, basically says, oh, and also every user that logged into the application was given an API key. Let me see if I can find where it says it in the article real quick. Yeah, was given an API key in the application on the front end, apparently, that they could access. And via that API key, they could query the rest of the database to query for the private messages between any other user, right? So there's just a fundamental like architecture misdesign or like misunderstanding of how these things should work in, in this application. Now there isn't a ton of detail out about like what the word API key means in this context. Like is it an API key for a backend service that Firebase use it, is it, an, is it an API key for T itself? Either way, by design, the fact that the user has exposed to them an API key is super weird. The way that like traditional application design works, and again, I don't wanna fucking hear about server side components, okay? This is like how every application should be designed and how like separation of responsibilities should be architected to keep security simple, right? There is a database. The database has a username and a password to get into the database, right? To get into the database to make queries, typically the way that it works is that the username and password of that database should be stored in an API. So that lives here, right? In some kind of environment variable or some kind of security vault that contains the credentials of that DB. Okay, and then now to get into that API, typically there's some kind of authentication that happens here. So there's a DB here for the, uh, you know, the images or the messages. And there's also a DB here for the users, right? Or a table for the users. And so the way that this would work is user goes to log in and says, hello, I am, I am Sheila123 at AOL.com, right? And they say, okay, cool. You are Sheila123 at AOL.com. Very cool. So now the user has some kind of token that the API can use to verify that they are who they say they are, either a JSON web token or a session cookie, right? Something very simple. And then from there, all of the communication between the user and the API is known to be between the, or between like this user, right? And so the ability to query data should only be data that is accessible via this user, right? The fact that a, an API key was given directly to the user implies that like there's some other service on the back end, potentially another Firebase service that the user was given like a long string of characters for and through this API key, they could just go reach directly into the database and pull out any content. That means that like there is no security model, there is no like within the database like hardening that says that like, oh, a message is aligned to a user and only this user can query off of, like it just complete disregard for security in this one. And it may be the case that like when, after they were authenticated, for example, right, they logged in with their username, their username and password, they were given an API key. And, but like, but again, like the API key, the whole point of an API key is like this secret that an API has internal to the code, similar to like database credentials. And only the, like the API has that permission. When you give out API keys, unless they are properly scoped, which I don't know of any API providers that allow you to do per user scoping of an API key. Like the, the fact that this was the design is truly insane. What it smells like to me is like they put an API key for some backend API in code that they thought the user couldn't see like some JavaScript somewhere. And then because people forget that like JavaScript is a front end language that like the browser gets or the application gets, when the application was rendered, the rendering went to the browser and then you could just extract the API key and then bada bing, bada boom, you're not only your own user, you're the backend user, which is like, you know, the God mode user of the application. And because of that, you could download everything out of the database. I don't know, man. It's I'm having a hard time verbalizing this because I don't know how somebody makes this decision. It's like giving the user the API key, just like it invalidates 
every modern like design principle when it comes to like basic web applications. And yes, I know I'm like a hardware, like kernel mode security guy. Okay. But I've also like designed web apps. I've also written my own share of Python code and I've gotten it right most of the time. Okay. So like, I'm, I'm not, I'm stupid, but I'm not that stupid. Okay. Again, the reason that I'm making this video is because like, I don't want to like highlight this too much more. I don't want to make like the, I don't want to make a mockery out of people that were, that were like affected by this, right? This is a really, really serious issue. And the reason I'm making this video is I cannot emphasize enough how important it is in application design to make security the number one priority instead of making security the priority that like you kind of take your application that's finished and then like wrap it up in bubble tape, right? Like, like you, you like take your application and like you slap TLS on it and you call it a day because this whole situation, these applications that do provide utility, they do provide good things to users, but they just don't get it right. And because they don't get it so right, they get it so wrong. They can, they literally, like put the lives of people at risk. And it really scares me that this is like the future of the world we're going into. So guys, when you're like, you're making your next application, you can vibe code your shit. I don't, I really don't care. You just, I beg you to do some reading about security and like just how fundamentally these things should be architected so that you're not making T app 2.0. Anyway, that's it for now. Bit of a rant video. Hope you enjoyed. If you did, do me a favor, hit that like button and subscribe and we'll see you in the next one.